It's, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Diana Kramer. Uh, she's a board certified neurosurgeon who did her um, medical school work at uh, UCLA. I have a UCLA graduate who will come in in the next five minutes here, okay. you know, along with the rest of our pediatric team. Uh, she then did her residency at uh, Duke um, uh, University and, uh, and then fellowship with uh, Dennis Spencer at uh, Yale. Uh, like um, uh, several of us, has had a longstanding interest in, in the brain and uh, uh, not just like you vascular guys who, yeah. you know, how the blood gets to the brain, but the, the, how the brain itself works uh, and the cognitive neuroscience of it. Uh, she uh, was involved in the uh, growth and um, a great work done at uh, uh, Swedish in the Epilepsy Center, a worthy competitor for, for several years, uh, and then uh, continued to work at Valley uh, before uh, uh, switching to her current career, uh, which is uh, uh, titled uh, The Study of Causation. And when I first heard this, I nodded my head knowingly, uh, like you're doing now, and then realized I have no idea what causation is uh, in this context, and that's why you're here today. So welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Dr. Ojeman. What is causation? According to Webster, causation is an act or an event or an agency that causes in effect. In medicine, causation is a risk factor or an event that can lead to a disease. And specifically for our clinical practice, causation is that epidemiologic study applied to the individual. I'm going to start with a clinical example. A 37, you are asked to see a 37 year old man who's been in an MBA. His electric I3 BMW was stopped at a stop sign when he was rear ended. He was restrained. He did not hit any part of the vehicle. He did not lose consciousness. At the scene of the accident, he felt stunned, a little wired, adrenaline going. He was able to, drag, to drive his vehicle home. That evening, he felt neck and upper back pain. Within a week, he had two events where he felt pain running down his right leg. Within a month, he had eight out of 10 right leg pain and low back pain. He failed many conservative therapies, all the appropriate therapies, and he comes to your office. On examination, he has leg pain that equals back pain, and he has, clinically, he has an S1 radiculopathy on the right. His MRI is concordant with his symptoms. You opine that surgery is indicated. You are asked, is the need for surgery related to the motor vehicle accident? There is no right answer to this question. Your job, and my job as a physician, and we are asked this all the time, is how did these events lead to this illness? And that is the study of causation. What other information would you like to know about this gentleman? Has he had previous leg or back pain? Does he have multi-level degenerative changes? What if he didn't have a disc and all he had was foraminal stenosis? What if he has spondylolisthesis? What if he has a history of depression? How would these changes inform your decision and your answer to this question? This lecture is going to be divided into three sections. One on causation, two on clinical applications for us as active practicing neurosurgeons. Three, I'm going to end with some research questions which I think arise out of this information. You're all aware of the evidence-based medicine pyramid, probably, oh, probably painfully over aware. And I'll be referencing this. You may find some light blue lettering on the left hand of the slide in the bottom, and that'll be a level. The level of evidence will be placed there when I can, when I had either thought to do it or had time to do it or if it's not a correlation of multiple studies. 
We're going to start with three, what I consider three giants in the field who've been doing causation work, research and causation, for over 20 years. Jerry Jarvik, Michel Battier, and Jean Kerrigy. Then we'll try to go to the cervical literature, which is not as solid as the lumbar literature, and review that literature. The prevalence uh, of lumbar degeneration in asymptomatic people. Could I get a show of hand of anybody who's 45 years old, plus or minus five, 40 to 49 in this room right now? Okay, great. If you <coughs> take the asymptomatic persons in this room, people, and you MRI them, <coughs> lumbar spine, 70% of asymptomatic 40-year-olds, 40, 40 to 45-year-olds, have degenerative changes in their lumbar spine. 50% have a lumbar disc bulge. 35% have a disc protrusion sitting here in this audience today. Just looking at this data makes you want to, makes you want to have your back hurt almost. However, these are people with no back pain. This is that data I just showed you in graphic form. And this is important not only from a clinical point of view, but from a research point of view. I can separate this data in my mind. See if I can do this. Maybe I can't into three groups. No, it's not what I wanted. It's definitely not what I wanted. Okay. Three groups. So blue group has degenerative changes at age 20, and they increase over time. The red group has degenerative changes over at age 20, and they don't change very much over time. And the green group is essentially symptom or disease free early in life and changes occur over time. I'm going to start with that first group. By age 30, one in three of us has degenerative changes in our lumbar spines. Defined as disc degeneration, signal loss, height, disc height loss, disc or disc bulge <clears throat> and those are influenced with age and also by genetics and we'll get to that as well at age 30 and at age 20 one in three of us has a ruptured disc a disc protrusion in our lumbar spine and annular fissures related to disc uh, pressure probably are present early and don't change very much over time. This is this data is actually the opposite of a general population feeling that discs wear out and rupture as we get older. And this data does not support that idea. Finally, facet degeneration and spondylolisthesis are relatively absent early in life and increase over time with age. In summary, none of us is getting out of here without paying, death, without paying taxes or having degenerative changes in our lumbar spine. What about twin studies? Michelle Battier, with the support of Laura Gibbons, who's here at UW, began her studies in the 1990s, early 1990s. She looked at the Finnish twin cohort, and she identified over 600 pairs of tw identical twins, and she looked for discordance in history for smoking, whole body vibration, and heavy work. So for example, she looked at twins, identical twins, where one 
was a journalist, one was a farmer, one was a physician, one was a truck driver, one was an accountant. You get the picture. The, um, and, and they MRI'd these people at the beginning of the study in 1992. They MRI'd them on average about 17 years later. Their spines looked the same independent of lifetime workload. This is a study, this, this is a, a graph from one of her papers. The incidence of physical loading was felt to be the least contributor, the least contributing factor. Age was a mild to moderate factor. The largest factor was what is called family aggregation or family aggregate, which is essentially a nurture and nature question combining both early exposure and genetics. And then there's a large unknown component. But what she found is that genetic factors are probably very strong. They went on to clone the first two genes, both of which were vitamin D receptor protein mutations. There have been a number of uh, genes related and associated now with degenerative changes. In summary, her work showed that genetics have a strong influence on degenerative changes. Age has a small association. There is no association with workload or lifetime whole body vibration, according to her studies. And smoking has a small effect. In fact, they were able to factor that out after doing multivariate uh, analyses. They think it's about a 2% effect, which is how strong her data is. I'm going to go on to Eugene Carrigy. He's at uh, Stanford University's Chair of Orthopedics. And again, over the last 20 years, he's compiled an impressive body of information. He found 200 people with no low back pain. They had cervical spondylosis, and he loaded the deck. He made the supposition, based on the body A work, that they were genetically predisposed to have degenerative changes because of their cervical degeneration. A hundred of those patients or people, subjects, had no pain. He then further loaded the deck. He recruited a hundred people from that same group who had chronic neck pain but no low back pain or had another chronic non-lumbar pain syndrome. All subjects were working. <laughs> Every six months, he had a team of nurses that would call. Hi, Mr. Jones, how are you doing? How's your back? Oh, okay, tell me about that. You were, how'd it happen? You woke up with it. You were lifting a box at work. You were in a car wreck. Did you have an MRI? If they found, if the person had had an MRI, they went out and they retrieved that MRI, they were able to retrieve 67 of 69 MRs and blindly read them compared to the MRI they did at the baseline, the baseline MRI they did at the beginning of the study. There were 16 episodes of major trauma. Major trauma was defined as breaking a proximal long bone or rupturing an internal viscera, or dislocating your pelvis or your, 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 your spinal column. So unless you broke your femur or ruptured your spleen, you are considered to have minor trauma. This included lifting events. A third of the lifting events were between 60 and 90 pounds in awkward <coughs> positions. It, it included motor vehicle accidents high and low speed, up to 30 miles per hour. Most of those motor vehicle accidents were low speed. Lifting sports injuries pretty much evenly distributed. There are also 
228 events of major low back pain, serious low back pain in people with no antecedent trauma. Serious low back pain was described as low back pain greater than six on a one to 10 scale for more than a week. There were 67 MRIs retrieved in 53 people. Several people had multiple imaging studies. 12% showed progression. Of those, three were thought to have, in their opinion, significant changes. One was a, was a new ruptured disc, occurred in a person without antecedent trauma. One was a new case of spondylolisthesis, which occurred in a patient with no antecedent trauma. And one, which occurred in a person with trauma, minor trauma, was an increase in degenerative disc changes by one grade from three to four. Their conclusion was that degenerative changes are uncommon after minor trauma, or new MRI findings are uncommon after minor trauma. They then looked at the pre-operative, the pre-study neuropsychological data. They did both Zung depression scores on all of these people, and they did a modified uh, somatic pain questionnaire. Three things stood out in univariate analyses. These were a pre-existing history of a claim, an abnormal psychological profile at baseline or smoking. And of those two, and two of those three in multivariate analysis predicted 93% of the individuals who went on to have chronic disabling low back pain. And none of adding the trauma incidents didn't affect that number. That is a study from 2006. And that, has not, that study has not yet made it into our collective thinking regarding, regarding lumbar spine disease. This is a great book, $78 on Amazon. Mark Melhorn and a group of his esteemed colleagues went through thousands of papers. And they did not do a meta-analysis, but they did a summary. And it's included in this book. This is a second edition. There's a third edition to be done soon. And it's, I think it's worth having. What they found is that there is insufficient evidence for heavy work lifting in an awkward position, twisting, or smoking, or obesity as risk factors for low back pain. There is strong evidence that previous low back pain is an independent risk factor for low back pain in the future, particularly in an occupational setting. There is strong evidence that several things are not related. Age is not related to pain, it is related to progression of degenerative changes. Prolonged sitting, standing and walking for two hours, exercise and leisure are not associated with degenerative changes. A summary of the evidence-based medicine from these three giants in the field are that lumbar degenerative changes are common, influenced by genetics, more than age, and rarely influenced by minor trauma. Degenerative changes do not equal symptoms, and disabilities predicted by your pre-injury pre psychosocial status and compensation issues. Can we extrapolate this data to the cervical spine, and if so, what are the limitations? So if you have it in your back, do you have it in your neck? The answer is yes. It's a study by Matsumoto where he again took asymptomatic persons and imaged them 
I'm going to call your attention to the yellow writing on the right hand of the slide at the top. There, if you have lumbar spine changes, there's a 60%, an 80% chance that you have them in your neck or thorax as well, and vice versa. And it makes some sense since the entire body is exposed to the same genetic risk factors. Okay, now I'm going to pick on the 50-year-olds. Anybody in the audience in 50 to 59? Okay. I'm sorry, would you mind going back to the last slide? How could you? Sorry. So 79 have cervical spine findings, 90 lumbar spine, and the tandem findings of both of those are more than cervical. Can you repeat the question, please? The, the, the percentage is lower in cervical spine alone versus tandem. These are different cohorts. So if you do, if you limit, if you, and this is also a, a, a wide range of patients, and it's all levels. 90%, if you put this room in an MRI machine, 90% of us would have lumbar changes. If you took another group or the same group and imaged the neck, about 70% of us would have cervical spine changes. And the group that would have both, or thoracic, is about 80%. So about 10% of people are going to have one without the other or vice versa. It's not 100% correlation, but it's pretty close. Back to the 50-year-olds in the room, or the 60-year-olds, we can feel even worse. In asymptomatic persons, 85% of 60-year-olds, that includes me, have a disc bulge in their neck, but only 30% of us actually have a protrusion. And this, if you remember the lumbar data, disc protrusion was something that was present at age 30 and didn't increase over time. This data to me looks similar. The similar graph regarding the natural history of cervical spondylosis. I see this separated into two groups. Okada, when he did this study, looked at it in a, in a bimodal distribution. He said, what are the changes that occur before age 40? The disc herniations, which would lead to dural compression, and decreased signal occurred under 40 years of age. Over 40, disc space narrowing and foraminal changes, degenerative bony changes occurred. I just want to make the point that the data are different for every single level in the lumbar spine and in the cervical spine. So if we're going to, and this needs to inform our research protocols, because if we are going to look for adjacent segment disease versus degeneration, we need to identify the natural history probably in the lower lumbar spine as opposed to the upper. It will not be adequate to do complete spinal aggregate measurements. What does the science say about neck pain? There is insufficient evidence for heavy work, neck posture, prolonged work in a sedentary position, repetitive or precision work, or smoking to be risk factors for neck pain. Females and, and people with previous neck or shoulder pain are at increased risk for, for, for neck pain in the future, particularly in an occupational setting. And there's a weak association with age in the neck for pain. What about Chiari malformations? In a group of almost 20,000 subjects, this is a meta-analysis. If you look at the middle blue line, oh, I'm off, sorry. There we go, thank you. If you look at the, if you look at this, this marker, 
the non-neoplastic incidental findings, structural changes in the brain, are studied about 2 to 3% over the entire life of, of uh, individuals. This study <coughs> estimated that the, uh, the, evidence, the incidence of asymptomatic PRE1 malformation in this group of 20,000 subjects was 1 in 400. Dr. Tater in Toronto looked at his study, I think it's Toronto, it may not be, looked at his study of 85 subjects that he had done surgery on retrospectively and identified 11 that had antecedent trauma. He created a list of inclusion criteria, which you see here. Three, so you had to have no symptoms, have a trauma, and then have symptoms within six months, which actually fit with Chiari. And then you had a surgery and you got better. Three of his 11 patients with antecedent trauma met those criteria. What about carpal tunnel syndrome? There are a lot of things that cause carpal tunnel syndrome. When is it work-related? High force, forceful grasp, repetition, and vibration are all risk factors. However, in isolation, they are not known risk factors for carpal tunnel syndrome. However, a combination of these forces is. So, forceful grasp and repetition, chicken pluckers. Repetition and vibration, or forceful grasp and vibration, the guy that's out buffing the hallways at night is at risk for carpal tunnel in an occupational setting. What about keyboarding? Does keyboarding cause carpal tunnel syndrome? The epidemiologic studies show that people who keyboard most of the day <coughs> have a lower incidence of carpal tunnel syndrome than the general population. And there is some evidence that keyboarding may be protective. I'm going to switch to a more clinically based application of this data now. I'm going to start with vitamin D. Vitamin D is all the rage, I get that. For us as neurosurgeons, it is important because vitamin D improves bone health and vitamin D improves fusion rate. This is a, a, an open label study by Dr. Guy. He found patients, took a, a group of clinic patients who had low back pain, identified if they were deficient and gave them 60,000 units of vitamin D a week for eight weeks. That's almost half a million units. Their levels went up to about 36. And as their pain, their levels went up, their pain went down and stayed down. Now, if we got this data from an operative study, if we could take a VAS score from eight to four, we would think that was clinically significant. The non-union rate. Dr. Ravindra went to the OR post-op and drew vitamin D levels in patients that had just had fusions and followed them for two years. The fusion rate eventually was the same. However, at 12 months, which is usually when we stop looking, the non-union rate in the people with a vitamin D level over 30 was half, the, was half of the non-union rate of the people who were vitamin D deficient. So if there's one take home message from this data that I'd like you to think about today, it is what is the vitamin D level in your fusion patient as you go to the OR? These people reach levels in the 30. However, the data suggests that a level of 30 is not the best 
is not an optimal do uh, level for bone health. So 30 may be a bare minimum. And this slide is in, you, is in here to remind me to take my vitamin D, but also that vitamin D is a fat-soluble vitamin. And the bigger you are, the higher your BMI, the more you need. What about depression? I'm going to show you some conflicting data now. It's a small study by Fon. We consider, we look for surgical outcomes. Pre-op neuric scale, whether or not you can walk, whether or not you have a myelopathy, a radiculopathy, motor deficit, or the number of level fused. Those are all things that as neurosurgeons, we feel are important to outcome. But in this study, depression was as important as any of those cardinal features which we think are important. <laughs> this is a study that did not find, this is just published, was well, published in February 2017, Journal of Neurosurgery Spine. This study, the title is, well, I don't think so. Paraphrase. What they did find was that depression worsened your preoperative neck disability index. They did not find in a group of about 50 people that that had any effect on postoperative outcome. And I've included both of those slides, that, that's these two studies, and they're in the references at the end of this lecture. However, there's a lot of data that suggests that many neurological diseases are affected in terms of outcome by depression. So are we asking the right questions when we do our outcome studies? Depression is a comorbid, comorbid condition. It's associated with anxiety, migraine, alcoholism, PTSD, motion sickness, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome. So if you are in the clinic and the patient is in distress, we as surgeons want to help. That's why we do this. However, if the clinical syndrome does not match the imaging findings. And particularly if you walk out of the room and you're distressed, perhaps there's a bigger differential diagnosis that should be considered. Because we want to make people better. But if we don't do the operation for the right reasons, for, for best clinical indications, we can make the patient worse. And we've all had this experience. Same thing for lumbar disease. Again, if you're sitting in a room with a patient who says, doctor, fix me, what are your alternatives? The thing that works the best is exercise. Everything else we think may help really doesn't. Exercise helps. There's a study in the British Medical Journal where Dr. Kolu took a group of nurses with non-specific low back pain, thought to be from lifting in their jobs. And he looked at their exercise patterns. If they met a minimum of 90 minutes of exercise a week, cardio and strength, that there were 10% of those nurses that actually met that criteria, which is about what the, gen the general population does. Their costs were 80% lower than the nurses who did not exercise. Their medical costs. And that included whether or not they went to work. Not every patient we see is a nurse, but do you think this could generalize to a, general pop to a larger population? 
According to Consumer Reports, yoga, tai chi, massage, chiropractic therapy, and physical therapy were the therapies that the survey thought worked best. Neurosurgery is next on the list, but it didn't make the top five. What about whiplash? The literature is not as good on whiplash, but ge in general, whiplash and whiplash-associated disorder, or WAD, is, a, so is affected by, is not affected, I'm sorry, is not affected by the severity of the crash, whether or not you know it's coming and you tense up, whether or not you're looking to the right or left. And that's a little controversial. It's not related to pre-existing degenerative changes. In the cervical spine, it's also not related to pre-existing degenerative changes or rupture discs in the lumbar spine. That study has been done. And fewer claims are made when pain and suffering compensation is removed. We know that from the California data. Young women have more whiplash than men. That's thought, the theory is that we have the same size head, but we have smaller necks, smaller neck muscles. However, only about half of whiplash patients are pain-free at a year. Whiplash outcomes are worse if somebody has psychological stress post-injury, particularly catastrophizing or passive coping style. And if you really want to make somebody worse, put them in a cervical collar and have them get lots of care. Because that predicts poorer outcome. If I tell you you're sick, I'm your doctor, you're going to believe me. Study by Matsumoto took a group of patients, imaged them all, 10 years later went back, re-imaged them. His capture rate was about 50%. A decade later, 26% of the whiplash patients still had pain. The controls had about a quarter of the whiplash patients had pain. About 10% of the control group had neck pain. On imaging, the whiplash group had more signal loss than the control group. If you looked at structural changes, there was no difference. So if you looked at an actual physical space occupying presence, there was no difference. If You compared the neck pain in that 26% of patients that still had neck pain with the MR changes, there was no correlation. They concluded that neck pain after whiplash cannot be explained by MRI findings. And this is important to your clinical practice because we often get a patient who says, doctor, I never had this kind of pain before my accident. And we base our relationship with our patients on trust and respect. However, it's not only patients that have claims or perceive someone else to be at fault, but also our everyday patients who have neck pain who don't think somebody else is at fault, who have trouble remembering. I'm going to walk through the slide with you. If you compare a patient's chart before and after the collision, to their reports, patients with neck pain where they perceive no one is at fault can accurately give you a history of whether or not they've had diabetes or hypertension in the past. However, almost half of them will not remember previous neck or back pain, previous drug abuse or alcohol use, or report it or serious psychological distress. 
in a group of subjects who feel that somebody else is responsible for their pain an injury that they somebody else did to them that number rises to 80 percent and i this is a phenomenon these i do not believe that these people are lying to us i don't think they remember and the group that perceives somebody at fault not only doesn't remember their pre-injury pain they report themselves as being healthier than a control group and healthier than the general population prior to their injury this is a phenomenon we do not understand risk capacity tolerance this is a book by Jim Talmadge uh, it's a great book it's a short read I put the ebook up here for the younger generation as physicians we work and are we to opine in terms of risk and capacity? Patients think in terms of tolerance. Risk, is it safe? Can this person with active epilepsy go out and get a commercial driver's license? No. Capacity assumes maximum training. So our gentleman, Mr. I3, has been off for six months, you've done his surgery. His capacity is not where it would, was prior or a year ago to this incident. However, he has the ability to improve his capacity, both rehab, exercise, physical therapy, et cetera, going back to work part-time. So we often opine on current ability. How much can Mr. I3 lift? after his discectomy and there is data on that mr i3 is going to talk to you in terms of what he thinks he can do what can he tolerate tolerance is patient specific different in every person and influenced by reward our tolerance for work and sleep deprivation is a little above the national average in this room. If I ask my child to unload the dishwasher for 25 cents, it's not enough reward. If I ask my child to unload the dishwasher for $25, it'll probably get done. That's tolerance. I think this body of knowledge can inform our research. Which is better, vitamin D or BMP? Which do you, I'm, an, I'm aging, to so the younger group here, disability has increased by 200% in the last decade, and the population is aging. As medical practitioners, this is a cost-effective question we should be looking at. Should we, are we looking at the right surgical outcomes? So, four different therapies for fusion. We will be deciding which is best. This is a neurosurgical or orthopedic research question. Young women have more whiplash. What else do more young women have? Migraine. You do a great operation on somebody, say it's a woman, for their radiculopathy, they come back and they say, Doc, my arm feels great, but my neck is killing me. So this is a random sampling of Google photos, photos for whiplash, migraine, and degenerative changes of cervical spine. And I have trouble telling which one's which. We all see this with cervical spondylosis, interscapular pain, 
But if you've ever had a migraine, try to recall if you had neck pain and upper back pain with your migraine. And this is an area that's ripe for research and which is highly clinically significant. I'm going to end with adjacent segment D. Adjacent segment degeneration, adjacent segment disease. If you're going to do this study, which degenerative change are you going to pick? And which level? So, so let's bring this back to Mr. I3. We do a lumbar microdisc. Is he going to have more adjacent segment disease at L4-5 in a decade? Or is he going to have the natural progression of his pre-existing condition? And what is the number of people we need to put in a study to answer that question? I think it's huge. Thank you for your time.